thing we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters. Never mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. You found your way to the intersection of faith and politics. Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green, also found online at wallbuilderslive.com and wallbuilders.com, and also on Facebook. You can follow us there as well and comment on the shows as you get a chance to listen to them. And in fact, you might have a show you'd like us to cover, a topic or an interview. You can email that to us at radio at wallbuilders.com. And we also encourage you to let your local station know if you'd like to hear us locally and we're not on a station there close to you. If you're not familiar with which station we're on close to you, then go check it out at wallbuilderslive.com. Com. Here we go to Building on the American Heritage Series with David Barton. Christian involvement in government and in civil government, is that appropriate? Should we as Christians be involved in government and should we take our Christian values into government? Well, the, the answer of is it appropriate, better question is, is it biblical? And the answer is yes, it is biblical. You look at all, all of those in the Bible who are involved in the civil arena, what you have is Hebrews 11, is the Faith Hall of Fame, all the yeah. heroes of our faith. Well, everybody listed from verses 22 through 34 was involved in civil government. Now, why would God put them in as heroes and, and hold them up to us and say, hey, you can be like these guys if He thought we shouldn't be involved in the civil arena? Wait, wait, wait. Politicians in the, in the Politicians Faith Hall of Fame here? <laughs> oh, it, it gets worse than that in the Bible. If I go to Romans 13, twice in verse 4 and once in verse 6, God says those that are in civil government are, quote, ministers of God. That's the same term minister that you have for a church minister. So, so that means government's a mission field just like anything else. See, God else. doesn't make the distinction between secular and spiritual that we do. I mean, can you imagine being at the great white throne judgment and everybody coming before and the books are open, you get the Lamb's Book of Life and the works and, and everybody's getting judged and here comes a guy and God says, oh, let this guy off, he's a politician, my word doesn't apply. No, everybody's going to be judged by his standards. The Bible applies to every aspect of life. God does not make that artificial distinction of this is secular, this is spiritual. He wants everything to be under the principles that, he, that he's given us because it's for our best good. I mean, he tells us, everything I tell you is to make you successful, prosperous. Deuteronomy 6, 24, uh, Joshua 1, 8, all those things are for our benefit. Uh, take what happens in, in Luke 19, where that Jesus tells the story of how he gets the servants together. He gives to each one of them a mina, that, that trust. And one guy took the mina, didn't do anything with it. One guy took the mina, turned it into five. One guy took the mina and turned it into ten. And as we know, it says, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know why, but we stop it right there. But that's not what he said. He said to the first guy, hey, you took the one, turned it into five. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to make you ruler over five cities. And the other guy says, hey, you took one, turned it in ten. I'm going to make you ruler over ten cities. Whoa, wait a minute, I thought you were rewarding me. You put me in government, I'm going to be a ruler over cities? That's the way God views it. Mm. How come we don't see that as a reward? I mean, he sees that as a reward. He's dead serious about this. You've done so well. I'm going to put you in the civil arena. I'm going to, I'm going to make you ruler over five cities or ten cities. I'm going to make you a governor or a state rep or whatever it is. That's biblical, and, and we knew that. I mean, it seems like the perception today, though, from the Christian community is if you're in politics, you, you can't be a good Christian. That, that, that's, that, you, know, yeah. you can't be good and holy if you're in that arena, or even business in some other areas, but specifically But politics. you hit it. That's the perception today. That's not the biblical perception. As a matter of fact, here's a bunch of historical sermons. Uh, here's a sermon from 17. 1999, one of the leading theologians they Jedi Morris, and it's a sermon on, on citizens, the duties of citizens in America. Uh, here's one from 1825. The duties of an American citizen is delivered on the day of public fasting. Oh, that's even worse. Government declared a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer? Yeah. Wow. See, we didn't think there was a secular and spiritual arena. God's principles applied to all. Uh, here's a sermon from 1864 on the relation of the citizen to the government. Every generation before this one thought it was fine to be involved in what's happened. Was we've let the secular world say, hey, you, you spiritual people shouldn't get involved in ours. Y'all, this is ours. The, who said it was theirs? When did it become, when did they get to take it over? When, yeah. when did we get told we couldn't be involved? We got the same rights of the citizen than anybody else does. We don't lose our rights for being a Christian, but somehow we've let the secular people tell us what we can and can't do and what we have to think and what we can't think. What's the right response to that now? You, you seem to see more and more pastors speaking out on yeah. this issue and, and encur even encouraging young people, if God's called you in that arena to go, That's is right. that what we should be doing? Oh, you bet. We, we've got to get involved in every, I mean, the, the, the Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Yeah. Everything except politics. It doesn't say that. <laughs> no exceptions no, it, it, It's his. Everything is His, and what we do by pulling ourselves out of the civil arena, I mean, one thing for sure, Jesus said, hey, you're salt. You're the thing that preserves this. 
Well, guess what? If we pull ourselves out of the civil arena, we pull the preservative out. It's going to get rotten real quick. I wonder why business is so corrupt now. We've got all these guys on Wall Street and Bernie Madoff's going to jail. It's because we got all the Christian guys out of business and they took their values with them. And now the unchristian guys, it's just, it's simple. We got to be involved in every single aspect of life and living. Okay, David, how about some questions on Christian involvement in politics? Yeah, let's do it. I want to be an informed citizen, but I also want to know that my information is reliable. Where can I go for information that I can trust? Sounds like somebody that wants to go vote, yeah. wants to maybe even volunteer and, and help candidates or contribute to candidates. But how do I find out who the good folks are and, and get good information? Uh, there's several ways of doing that. One is one of the things that we've done over the years is created a website that is known as ChristianVoterGuide.com or JudeoChristianVoterGuide.com. And what we do is we collect what would be called the pro-family voter's guides of where candidates stand on biblical issues. So federal candidates, uh, a lot of state candidates, but governors and representatives and senators and presidents. So they can go to that voting guide and, and they can get that. That's, that's one way and to do it. And this is the one that's got the map on it, so I can got actually click on that's my right. state and it'll pull up all the ones from my particular that's state. That's right. Okay. And what you'll find is that a lot of states will have some type of voter guide that monitors where people are. For example, National Right to Life, that's a national group, but there's state right to life groups and they will monitor where an individual is on the life issue. And by the way, let me just do a little commercial here for a minute on, on the issue of life. You go back to the Founding Fathers, when they told us in the Declaration that among other rights were three, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Those are inalienable rights, which means they're God-given rights. Pursuit of happiness, they defined as the ability to pursue and to acquire and own and enjoy your own property. So what they're saying is, look, God-given rights that you have, the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to property, and they said there are others, but these are the three we're listed in the Declaration. They came back 11 years later and listed the, uh, a bunch of others. But it's interesting that Sam Adams and others looked at that and said, no, that's a priority. Life is first, then liberty, then property. But life is at the beginning. He said first is a right to life. And in this culture today, we say, well, wouldn't it have been cool if they'd been talking about the abortion issue back then? And I don't they know were. why we think that they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because they were, I mean, back in the 1770s, Thomas Jefferson was passing anti-abortion laws. As long as there have been people who were pregnant, there were people who didn't want to be pregnant. So abortion was an issue back then. It's actually written about by James Wilson, one of the founding fathers who signed the Declaration and the Constitution, who started the first law school in America, who was an original Supreme Court justice. He wrote about that abortion issue. And, and in talking about that, he said, in, in the contemplations of law, life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. He said in the contemplations of law, as soon as it's known that there's life in the womb, it's protected by common law. So if they believe that, then when they said the purpose of government was to protect life, liberty, they had to be thinking even in the cases of abortion, well, you need to protect life. John Witherspoon made a great point. He said the difference between America and Europe on the abortion issue is over there in Europe, they think that parents create life, so they allow parents to take life because they created it. Here in America, we know that parents didn't create that life. God created that life. We don't allow parents to take life. He said, only, only, only over that secular thing do you think that, well, it, it's my child. I, I created it, and I don't want it to be born, so I'll take it out. He said, you can't do that in America. In America, we recognize that God creates life. Parents were involved, but God created that life, and therefore, you cannot take that life. So not even the parents Not even take the parents. And, and that's that, John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration, president of Princeton University, said this is big difference between America and Europe, is, mm -hmm. and that's an abortion issue. So when you look at the abortion issue, what you'll find, and the reason the Founding Fathers put that at the top of the list is, if a candidate will not protect the first of your inalienable rights, the most important, he's not going to protect the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and that's why you'll find, if you can find where a candidate stands on the life issue, if you can find on that issue, and, and, and all the years I've been involved in politics, deal politics, deal with thousands of candidates and elected officials and congressmen, governors and presidents. If I can find out where someone is on the life issue, the abortion issue, with 90% certainty, I can tell you where they are on every other. I can tell you where they'll be on taxing and spending. I can tell you where they'll be on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I can tell you where they'll be on the START Treaty. I can tell you where they're going to be on bailouts. I can tell you where they're going to be on any other issue. So even I'm though going, you haven't looked at their voting record yet on that stuff, if I, you know, I know if they're pro-life or not, because it'll indicate. What I know from their voting record is if they do not protect life, which is the first of the inalienable rights, they won't protect the First Amendment right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. They're going to be against life. They're also going to say, oh, we don't need kids mentioning God at a graduation. We need a separation of church and state. We don't want anybody talking about God publicly. They'll be wrong on the First Amendment right for free exercise of religion. Because if they're not willing to defend that most important they right, want, why would they defend the other? If they're wrong on the, on the life issue, they'll be wrong on the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, 
The Founding Fathers called that the biblical right of self-defense. Strange thing, people that are pro-abortion are anti-defend yourself. Mm -hmm. If they're wrong on the life issue, they'll be wrong on the Third Amendment, which is the sanctity of the home. They'll, be, they'll get marriage wrong. It's a strange thing that those that are pro-abortion are also, uh, we want a new version, new arrangement of marriage. If they're wrong on the life issue, they'll be wrong on the Fifth Amendment issue of protecting private property of eminent domain and other things. If they're wrong on the life issue, you'll find that they vote wrong on every other inalienable right. Now, there is a movement in America that says, we don't care about those. Those are all social issues. All we care about are economic issues. And so there's, there's movements out there that say, we don't care about abortion or marriage or anything. We just want them to stop spending. We want to get out of debt. We don't want to mortgage in our children's future. Okay, if that's your issue, then for the federal level, there are groups that do nothing but monitor economic votes. Groups like the National Taxpayers Union, all they do is monitor. So you can look up your Congress. Monitor meaning they're watching those they're votes watch the vote. and, they're, exactly. and they're listing how each member votes on all these on, economic issues. On economic issues, issue, yeah. and, and there's hundreds of votes. And so what they do is they rank every, there's 435 members in the House, there's 100 members in the Senate, they will rank every one of those representative senators on the best economic people. So the number one economic guy in the House who protects money the most, who, who spends it the least, you know, all the way down through those who will take every bit of money they can, spend it and go in debt, they rank them all. It's a strange thing if I will take their voting record on the life issue and bump it up against their economic vote, it's almost exactly the same. I mean, if they were good on the money issues, it turns out they were good on if the life issues. If they were good on the life issues, they yeah, got the money issues. Yeah, that would come first, right? Yeah. That's the philosophy. If they get the first thing, it's inter you're 100% right to life, you're nearly always 100% on the economic issues. You're 76% right to life, you're about 76% on economic issues. Wow. You're zero on right to life, you're about zero. So you rarely, if ever, find somebody that's 100% pro-life and terrible on economic yeah. issues, or somebody that's great on economic issues yeah. but terrible on the life. And, and see, it makes a lot of sense because if they won't protect your life, they sure won't protect your money. Mm. Your money is a lot lower than your life is, and if they won't protect life, they won't protect money. So it, it turns out that from my standpoint, even though there's, there's voting records out there on all these different issues, I go to the life issue first, because if I care about my money, I want somebody who understands that you protect the first inalienable right. Well, that was always the reason I, I would ask like a commissioner candidate or something like that was I thought, well, this is the farm team. They may be in the legislature. That's right. But you've given me a whole added reason. It also will affect whether how they're spending my county dollars, exactly how they're right. spending my school board dollars. Exactly right. So that that is an issue. Now, you, you go to voters guys like ChristianVoterGuide.com, and, and it's linked to hundreds and hundreds of these pro-family, biblical issue voting guides from across the country, and that's a good way to know where candidates stand. But the other thing is every single candidate, like in federal office or state office, has voting records. You can go to state archives, you can go to, in, in the case of federal, uh, the Library of Congress monitors every vote, and yeah. you can go to thomas.loc.gov, and you can pull up their votes on any issue. You can pull up their votes on environment or anything else you want. They're all there. So because of what we have with accessibility through internet type stuff today, real easy to know where everybody is. Okay, back to the audience. Let's get another question on Christians' involvement in civic government. I want to believe that Christians like me can make a difference at the polls, but there are times when my vote feels insignificant. Is there any correlation between the amount of Christian participation and the outcome of an election? Well, this one hits a little close to home for me, David. I mean, my first election, I lost by 20 votes out of 30,000, yeah. and then won by 36. So clearly, I've experienced that every vote really does matter. But I think people sometimes feel like, I'm just one vote. How can I make a difference in this big picture? And, and that, that is part of the problem we have with having a nation of more than 300 million folks. We say, golly, I'm just one person. But you know what happens is the feeling that you have as being just one person, tens of millions feel the same thing. Yeah. And so we say, I'm just one. What can I do? Well, yeah, there's, there's only one raindrop among millions in a cloud, but all those millions put together make a flood. And so what happens is we get ourselves talked out individually saying, I, I'm just one, I don't feel significant. You may not feel significant, but there's a ton of other Americans that feel the same way you do. And if all of them will go vote, it makes a huge, massive difference. Now, is there a correlation between Christians getting involved, even when we feel insignificant, and yeah. what happens in the election? The answer is yes. This is something we've been tracking for a number of years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my computer, sit it up here, I'm just going to go through some stats. These are, uh, for instance, voting stats, how often voting people stats show up, or on, on how many what show happens, up? If Christians show up, and if they carry their values with them, and what the results, and, and these are all federal elections. Okay. I'm going to take you back to 1992 to 1996. In that period of time, there was a 17% decrease in the number of Christians who voted in an election. The next four years, between 96 and 2000, there's an additional decrease of 23%. So eight years in a row, we're going downhill. Eight we're, years we're in a row, votes. we have dropped four election cycles, eight years, we've dropped 40% of Christian voter turnout. The problem is Proverbs 29 2, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Yeah. Well, if the righteous don't elect the righteous, they won't get there. I mean, yeah. it's not going to be the pro-abortion people that elect pro-life people to office. You've got to have people with the same values. So when there's a 40% drop in Christian voter turnout, it's 
percent less likely you're going to get a God-fearing person in office who holds those, those biblical values. So after having seen that plunge in those four election cycles, nearly 10 percent in election cycle, a lot of effort went into the 2002 election to get Christian voter turnout back up. And with all this effort that was being put in into voting, uh, it did result in an uptick uh, of voting. And, and the reason that it's significant is in that 2000 election, there are what are called evangelical voters, born again voters, Christian voters. An evangelical voter is someone who says, I, I go to church at least once a week. I pray, I read the Bible at least once a week. I have a life changing experience with Jesus. That, that's an evangelical. So, so it's a not serious all Christian. Christians, not everybody no. in church, it's a specific. Th those definition. are the ones that are considered to be very active in their faith. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution, but just felt like, man, the classes are boring, or it's just that old language from 200 years ago, or I don't know where to start? People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green, and it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's going to inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. Well, there's 60 million in America in the 2000 election, but only 15 million voted. One so, out of four. One out of four. Only 25% of Bible-believing active Christians voted. That means if I'm sitting in church on Sunday morning and I voted, there's at least three. Three sitting right beside you that did not did. vote. They could and, have. And see, of the 60 million, 24 million were not even registered to vote. So even though Jesus says, go be salt, go be light, 40% yeah. of evangelicals said, not me, man. I refuse to totally be salt. Totally checked and light. out of the process. Totally checked out. That by itself is enough to, you know, if, if evangelicals had showed up, there wouldn't even be a culture war in America today. I mean, we're in the culture war. It's kind of tied. We're even, but we've only had one fourth of the team on the field. Mm -hmm. Is what it amounts to. Because it's not just who you're electing; it's the policy that results that's right. from that, right? That's, and that's right. what you mean. You'd win all those culture You'd war win all issues those. because you got good people in. And so, in 2002, that's why there was such an effort. And so, with all the effort that went in 2002, was an uptick of two percent Christian voter turnout. That doesn't sound like a big two. increase, two percent. <laughs> but it is big because you've been losing ten percent in election for four straight elections. You've regained ten percent. You're up two on top of that. That's a twelve percent trend swing. So you've turned you turned it around. That. You can measure that. Now, the 12 percent trend swing, we can measure that by looking at what's called exit polling. Exit polling says, you voted. Tell me why you voted. What we found was in the 2002 election, 41 percent of people who voted said, I voted the way I did because of abortion. Abortion is what drove my vote. Now, significantly, within that group, 23 percent said, I vote straight pro-life, and 16 percent said, well, I vote straight pro-abortion. Well, that's a 7% advantage if you're pro-life. The yeah. pro-lifers now number the pro-abortion folks. So a 7% advantage, that'll make a difference in a lot of elections where you have a pro-life person running against a pro-abortion person. Make sure I understand what you're saying. So 40, 41% of them said abortion was what drove my, my vote. And of those people, far more of them said, I'm going to vote for pro-life pro -life. reasons. Yeah. And then there was a percentage. I voted for this person because they're a pro-life person versus I voted for this person because they're a pro-abortion person. Which gave an advantage to seven, candidates that were pro-life. That's right. Gave a seven percentage advantage. Now, the results of that was seen, for example, at the federal level. Congress of the United States, the, the freshman class of 2002 contained 54 freshmen. That's a fairly large freshman class. 54 freshmen. And of the 54, 36 of them were pro-life, which is a 67 percent pro-life wow. class. So that advantage in the that voting numbers resulted in an advantage having, in the House. Having an elevated number of people who voted said, I think abortion is an important issue, got people elected to Congress who said, we want to protect life. Two-thirds of those elected to Congress in the House that year said, we're here to protect life. In the Senate that year, we elected 10 freshman U.S. Senators. Eight out of the 10 we're pro-life, pro-faith, pro-family. Even better. Now we're, what is now it, 80%? Senate's where we need the most help. Yeah. Uh, 80%, we got an 80% class. Now, now that's good. That's 2002. Then we come to 2004. 2004, we actually had a 93% increase in Christian voter turnout. We had been down at, at 15 million evangelicals, and it came up to 29.8 million. So almost double, still less than half, but almost double. And the result of that was exit polling. You look at it again, 42% said I voted the way I did because of abortion. 
but instead of having a seven-point advantage in favor of pro-life people, it was actually up to having a 12-point advantage in favor. So Huge. now it's easier to elect a pro-life people because more pro-life people went to vote. The result of that was the freshman class of 2004, which in that class had 40 freshman House members, and two-thirds were pro-life, pro-faith, pro-family. In the Senate that year, you had nine U.S. senators, and seven of the nine were pro-life, pro-faith, pro-family. Now, let me put that together. In two elections, we have elected 94 members of the House of Representatives, and two-thirds of them are pro-life, pro-faith, pro-family. In the Senate, we've elected 19 U.S. senators in two elections, and 15 of the 19, or 79 percent, are pro-life, pro-faith. Wow. That's good stuff. But you elect them, you put them there because you want policies that yeah, look like that. You want like the victories that. at the policy level. So we win voted, we got good people elected. What happened after that? Now, the problem we have is that what has happened for a number of years is we have not passed any pro-life laws. I mean, since Roe v. Wade, Congress has not done a single thing to restrict the jurisdiction. Board. Now, they have 19 measures where they restrict the funding of abortion. The Hyde Amendment says you can't use federal funds for abortions. And yeah. we got the Weldon Dickey policy and the Kemp cast and all these things about you so can't. So we, we didn't stop abortion, we didn't but stop we it. had some victories. Where we just we... said we're not going to spend our money to do it. Yeah. Well, this new class comes in 2002, 2004. They're highly pro-life because the voters were highly pro-life. And they didn't pass the first law to restrict the jurisdiction of abortion. They passed the first four laws to restrict the jurisdiction of abortion. So we'd gone 30 years with, with, with no restrictions. And, and now we get, and for example, Infant Born Alive Protection Act, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, the Partial Birth Abortion Ban, the Fetal Farming Ban, four major laws. And by the way, statistics show that as a result of those laws, abortion went down in America 24%. Wow. So guess what? We showed up. We carried our values. We elected people who had our values. They get in office. They legislated with those values. It made a difference in policy. Absolutely. Now, that's 2004. Then we go to 2006. In 2006, there's a 30% drop in Christian voter turnout. We've been doing better for We've two election cycles. We've been going up, and now we're down. We're 30% off. drop. We went from that, that 28.9 million down to 20.5 million evangelical voters in federal elections. And so at that point, having a drop, we elected in, in, that year, the freshman class of the House was 54 members of, of Congress. Only 17 were pro-life. That's a 31% pro-life class. Guess what? Christians didn't show up. They didn't carry their values. And now we have two-thirds of the freshman class is pro-abortion, mm. anti-marriage, anti-religious. We're going backwards. In the Senate that year, we had 10 freshman senators. Only one of the 10 was pro-life, pro-faith, pro-family. We went from 80% freshman class to, 10%, to a 10%. Because we dropped that 30% that drop in Christian voter turnout. And by the way, having 10 freshman senators and only one thought marriage should be between a man and a woman, the statistics nationally at that point were 72% of the nation believed marriage should be between a man and a woman. Wait a minute. That means 7 out of 10 senators should have been should've pro-marriage. Been. Yeah. yeah, but see, this is what people have to learn. Congress never reflects the values of the people. It only reflects the values of those who voted in the last election. So even though you've got a nation this big, the, the, the Congress is not going to reflect right. the values of all those people. It's only that part that it's shows up. It's only the part that should have voted, part of that and part we didn't up. show up to vote. Now, when you get to 2008, we have an upturn in Christian voter turnout again. 66% showed up, 66% increase in 2008. And so at, at that point, we've gone up to 34.1 million, which is a big number. But the problem was exit polling. That year, all these Christians showed up and they did not carry their values with them. Only 6% thought that abortion was an issue, either for or against. Only 1% thought that marriage was an issue. Where it was, what, 41% in the It had been 42%. Percent. And now we're down to 6%. Now we're down to 6%. Oh, wow. And so Christians showed up, but they didn't carry their values. The result in 2008 was we elected 57 freshmen to Congress. I got to ask you, when you say they didn't carry their values, what do you mean? They're, they're, they're voting they went on... voting on all the, We don't care what abortion is. We've we got to save the economy. We don't care what abortion is. We've got to fix foreign affairs. We don't care. They didn't care about the value mm. issues. They cared about all these other issues. And caring about the other issues, they elected people to office who didn't hold their values. Okay. And, and so out of the 57 freshmen that we sent to Congress in 2008, only 23 were pro-life. That's 40%. It had been more Christians show up, the more pro-life people you get. Now we had Christians show up highest that it had been, and we're down below 50%. We're at 40%. So Christians were, were showing up, but they were voting just like non-Christians. That's, that's right. They were not, there's no Christian reflection of their vote. In the Senate that year, we elected, four, in 2008, elected 14 freshman senators. Out of the 14 freshman senators, only two were pro-life. It's 14%. So we didn't carry our vote. We showed up, but we didn't carry biblical values with us when we yeah. went to vote. We carried our pocketbook, but we didn't carry biblical values. Now, having said that, let's go to the 2010 election, because in the 2010 election, you actually have the highest recorded Christian voter turnout in recent years. And you also have a huge advantage in carrying their values. For example, 2008, only 6% said abortion's issue. 2010, you had 30% who said it was the driving issue, not just an issue, but the driving issue. And of that, you had 22% said we vote pro-life only. 
8% said, well, we vote pro-abortion only. Now we've got a 14-point advantage. Biggest advantage we've That's seen. That's going to elect a lot of people to office. That's the biggest one we've seen, a high Christian voter turnout. So the freshman class of, of 2010, pretty significant. Uh, instead of having 54, 56, 58 freshmen as we'd been having in previous years, the freshman class of 2010 is 97 freshmen, almost twice the size. 81 of them are pro-life. That so is it's the highest percentage we've seen as well. 84% pro-life Congress, pro-life, pro-marriage, pro-family, highest we've ever, highest turnout of Christian voters that carry biblical values with them. We have, this is the most pro-life, as a result of 2010, that produced the most pro-life Congress since Roe v. Wade. Wow. And you look at the Senate, there were 16 freshman senators elected in 2010. 13 of the 16 were pro-life, pro-faith, pro that's, that's, we're back to 81% again. Yeah. You know, it yeah. makes a huge difference. So, so it takes both, though. You've got to show up. You've got to bring your values with that's you. Right. If Christians will show up and they'll vote their values, then you get Even elected officials. Even if they officials. feel like they're the only one on the ship. Yeah. Even if they feel like it's a Titanic and I'm set, standing alone. You'll find out you're not alone. There's millions of people who have that same feeling of isolation that you do. If you'll just do what's right, if, if you go vote and carry your values with you and vote for people, uh, again, we talked about life is the first issue. If yeah. you get that one right, all this other stuff's going to work. You get the life issue right, the economics is going to work. See, the, the scripture says righteousness exalts a nation, not economics exalts a nation. If you want to be exalted, you're going to have righteous policies. That's biblical issues. It's not economic issues. When we vote our pocketbook above righteousness, we lose every time. We'll lose economics and we'll lose righteousness. So it's a great question. Question: Does, Is there a correlation between Christian voting and, and the stats? Yes, there absolutely is. And if we'll just go do that, if we'll carry, uh, vote as a Christian, carry our, our biblical values with us, protect life and protect marriage and all those things, man, it makes a huge difference. And as we saw in 2002, 2004, you start getting the laws passed that look like the values of the country. So the system works. System we just works. have to work the system. That's do, exactly right. Do the right. right thing and we'll get the good that's, results. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Thanks for listening today, folks. Many of you have the DVD set of the American Heritage Series. You can get the sequel, which is building on the American Heritage Series. A lot of new material, some fantastic programs you want to you have in your library. You can get it at our website today at wallbuilders.com. Stand undivided.